Good morning. That song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, by Hawaiian singer Israel, had a profound influence on me. I hope it did on you too. What a wonderful world. What a wonderful world. Despite all these challenging times. As Robin Williams said in one of his movies, let's enjoy the joys of life rather than look at the difficulties of life by using the words, capidium, capidium, seize the day, seize the day. Towards the end of 2020, when the pandemic crisis was at its high, affecting and impacting the world, I was mentally down, tired, low on energy, challenged. The health crisis was fast becoming an economic crisis and a social crisis. It was tough. Working from home was fine, but it was not fun either for someone like me, who all his life had got up every single morning and rushed to the office because that's where my work was. So to me, this was a new world. To me, this was a huge change. But that pause gave me an opportunity. And that's why I believed in those words. What a wonderful world. Time was an abundance. I could read much more than previous years, read many more books, read many more articles, including this lovely article, how will you measure your life by respected management thinker, thinker and Harvard Business School professor, Clayton M. Christensen. I remember listening to Professor Clayton Christensen on the campus at Harvard Business School. A towering person, something like six feet, five inches, a booming voice, every single word of his has a huge impact on his audience, tremendous impact on his audience. His message is authentic, it's clear and very powerful. But when I read the article towards end of 2020, I realized that I had not quite absorbed those messages internally. There was a gap and I did not want to subscribe to that message. People preach best what they need most. So in order to kind of overcome that, to internalize some of those messages, I wrote a blog post on that article. I was stunned when I had 125,000 reads in just about two weeks. So the message synced with a lot of people. So when the university invited me to present the first webinar for the year, I chose this subject, but I must have a disclaimer right at the outset. I'm not a life expert. I'm not a pop psychologist. I'm not a religious expert because the theory of how do you live your life or measure your life has been addressed in many different ways. I've read an article with some great messages and to me it has been a life-changing experience. And all I want to do is to share some of those significant points from the article. In a career spanning over four decades, I use the word four decades because I don't want the young people on the webinar to predict my age. Four decades is close to 40 years. In a career spanning 40 years, I have always found measurement to be something, the norm. It's not an alien concept to me. It's not something very difficult for me to understand or get used to, get used to. In the world of training, it's measurement of learning. In human resources, it's measurement of performance. In education, it's formative and summative assessment. In the world of business, it's internal rate of return. It's return on net assets. It's return on investment. I can quite understand measurement. But when I read this piece, measurement was completely on another dimension. It was about life. It was about your life. And all that I liked about the article, it didn't tell you what to do. It was not prescriptive. All that it did was to give you a set of tools and for you to figure it out. It was about using some business theories to answer some significant questions so that we can make the right life decisions. That was it. But when you talk about measurement, you can't talk about measurement without a context. In organizations, the measurement is about the performance of the organization in the market. 
So in reality in life, we will have to look at the environment. So today's environment is a crisis environment. Every day people look at the numbers of cases and get agitated, get worried, and they take the necessary recourse to stay safe. But Z Frank had this to say, and he said, if you look at every street corner, people are looking at their cell phones, and you might dismiss this as a bad trend in human history, but unfortunately, that's not what it is. That's the moment of truth. That's where life is lived. If you look at our living rooms, if four of us are there, four of us are on our cell phones, we have a conversation. The conversation is about a WhatsApp message on the cell phone. The truth of the matter is we have lost the art of engagement, the art of talking with one another and conversing with one another. This prompted one of my friends to impose a tech-free weekend. Every weekend, no digital gadgets are allowed in the house. They're all kept away, just that people can get back to the basics of engaging one another. If you walk on the corridors of the Federation University of Ballarat, Australia, you cannot miss those huge posters which says, forget, do not be distracted by the digital gadgets. Talk to your classmates, talk to your colleagues, that's life. So talking about measurement, Talking about the environment, I think it's critical for us to learn what to do, what matters most to us in order to move forward. Thank you so much, Karen, for that lovely introduction. Karen is a great learning facilitator who has worked with me for over two decades. So thank you so much for coming and saying those nice words. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me this morning on this webinar. When I listened, moving on, when I listened to Clayton Christensen, I was kind of excited. When I read the article, I was inspired. When I tried to kind of live those messages described in the article, I guessed and I knew it was very difficult. And when I wanted to present the ideas in this webinar, I realized how tough it is. It's just virtually impossible. So I tried to kind of summarize it and structure the webinar in a format that's easy to understand. The message is simple. How do we apply business thinking to our personal lives and use theory productively? How can we use these ideas in our personal lives to guide life decisions? That's it. No more, no less. And to understand the webinar and the messages in a structured way, I've structured it into three areas. One, the importance of reflection. Two, answering three questions using business theories. And three, choosing a metric by which our lives will be measured. So moving on, let's look at why do we want to reflect? In basketball, there is this concept called timeout. What is timeout? Is when the game is not on track, the coach says timeout, you come out, you pause and prepare for the future. And that's the importance of reflection. There is a saying, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. And we all recognize much later in our years what we should have done when we were young. Robin Sharma has this famous podcast, What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20 Years Old. So life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. The importance of reflection is reflected when each year ends and the new year begins. I'm not a new year reflections or resolutions person, certainly not a new year resolutions person, but whenever the new year comes across, I sit down with a colleague and I reflect what happened in the earlier year and what we should do the next year. My colleague does not give me any answers, just ask intelligent questions and I have to figure out the answers. Now I say this because three key questions. Why is your life what it is? What will your life be if you continue doing what you are doing? And what are some of the changes you need to do into the new year if you want to live the life that you hope to live? So we need to know 
where we want to go and we need to pursue that direction. Over the years, my roles have evolved. I have allocated some time, but then I figured out during the course of the year, there are challenges, obstacles, difficulties. So my resource allocation changes. So that's the purpose of the reflection time. I sit down, I reflect and say, okay, I need to get back on course. <coughs> In organizations, each organization charts the strategy and follows it. This is best amplified in Alice in Wonderland. Alice approaches Cheshire the cat that sits under the tree and says, which road should I take? And Alice responds, I don't know. And immediately, uh, I, I'm not quite sure. And immediately, Cheshire cat says, then it doesn't really matter, does it? If you don't know where you want to go, it doesn't really matter, does it? And that's the learning point that we take out from that little story from Alice in Wonderland. The key is figuring out where we want to go. If I don't know what road to take, and if I don't know where I want to go, then it doesn't really matter. In business and in organization, we chart the direction and we pursue it. But when we talk about that in our personal life, we seldom chart a life strategy. We chart, seldom chart a life journey. Now, when you talk about reflection, you can't run away from the concept of self. The notion of self is very important. University of Chicago psychologists meet, describe a self from a social perspective. And he said, the self is constructed with being in the world and the self emerges through social interactions and reflecting about thinking those interactions. Now, I'm an educator. I live in that world. So my personality is shaped by those social interactions and reflections about thinking those interactions. And recently, respected management thinker in Malaysia, Professor Tansri Dizou, director of the University of Science Islam Malaysia, was asked a question, is your university world class? And he responded, whose world are you talking about? So each one of us develop ourselves by being in that world where we are. And I think that's very important for us to understand because Mead said self-awareness and self-image are important components. And when we think about how people perceive us, then we develop and generate a self-image. And sociologists really talked about looking glass self. The importance of reflection is articulated in the viewpoint that as we reflect, we grow. So moving on, if we look at what Professor Clayton Christensen said, he said, all we want to do, the primary message is to apply business theories to answer three questions to guide our life. And every year at the Harvard Business School, he runs the course. He applies different case studies, different companies are studied, different theories are being used to study these companies. But towards the end of the semester, he says, Take those theories, but apply it on your own lives to answer three questions and you will figure out what the answers are. Each one of us figure out what the answers are. So business, what did business thinkers do? They developed a set of theories on how business works and each one of us is challenged to assess what's important. So what is theory? Theory is nothing, but it's a statement of causality. What causes what? and why and that's the key so we study the theories we understand and then we put on a th the lenses and try to understand why things are happening the way they are happening on what actions do we need to take in order to get the desired results most of us know theory most of us apply it knowingly unknowingly consciously unconsciously sometimes productively sometimes destructively now, if you take one of the theories that Professor Clayton Christensen developed, the theory of disruption, 
what what does the theory tell us it just basically explains the mechanism why and how successful companies fail new entrants new players coming into the market they come at the lowest end of the market to pursuit of market and pursuit of profits making it very difficult for successful companies to sustain themselves now does it mean that successful company did not have the right people no they had the right people so did that does that mean they did not do the right things yes of course they did the right things but probably they did not consider what these new players were doing and he explains it in many ways he says how cisco came in and pushed out the established players like nortel how someone like nuco mini meals came and pushed out the traditional steel players how someone like intel came with their celeron processor how people like airasia came in and pushed out the leading players in the market so that was a theory of disruption let's move on and say let's take thorndike's law of effect people repeat behavior which results in positive consequences people avoid behavior which results in negative consequences so in an organization people do things which gives them benefits well they perform well they get rewards compensation promotion and so on they don't do something they're indisciplined of course there is action punitive action you take it on to a personal life when children do well they get some rewards when they follow their parents wishes and they comply well they get some rewards but if they do something wrong well the privileges are withdrawn there's punitive action you park the car on the wrong side of the road of course you get a parking ticket it's a deterrent to repeat that behavior so we take some of these theories and apply it to our personal lives so that was the primary message of the article a theory is nothing but a statement of causality how can we apply these business theories to answer three questions moving on experiential educators and experienced learning facilitators always say this never tell people what to do get them to figure it out for themselves because it's when they figure it out for themselves it sticks the learning sticks albert einstein said education is not the learning of facts but training the mind to think and in the harvard business school the significance of the case study method is to look at each company through the lenses of certain theories using the theories to explain how the company got into the situation and to examine what managerial actions are needed to yield the required results and of course we explore how to make it work better the key is can we use those theoretical lenses to apply it on our personal lives that's the key message so we talk about measuring life talk about living life there are so many psychologists have done work so many religious experts have actually given us their views but here is an article not prescriptive at all just provides a set of tools apply the business theory and ask yourself questions so moving on what is living life by design many times we say it's just having and pursuing a life strategy a ship before embarking on a journey into the vast ocean needs a plan a plan for the journey the captain needs to know what the weather is like the captain needs to know whether there are obstacles challenges difficulties and if there are he needs to manage and navigate the ship around those challenges in business we call it risk mitigation or risk management in life of course some of these challenges happen real time and we got to make decisions real time and we're not going to get it right all the time we make we make mistakes and peter drucker the management legend said mistakes occur but don't let them recur we learn from these mistakes and get back on course so it's never too late to get back on track when you're off course and that's the learning when we looked at the pandemic crisis one of my academic colleagues towards the end of last year came up and said man proposes god disposes but another academic colleague who is a rationalist came and said while well, i believe in what sociologist malthus said the malthusian checks what are malthusian checks there are the natural checks of earthquake 
hurricane, tsunami, wars, pandemic crisis, whenever humans overstep their boundaries and they make this earth or this world unsustainable, natural checks kick in and we have those checks and balances to make sure that we have sustainable living. So what does this mean to us? What does living life by design means? The person you want to be cannot be left to chance. You got to plan it. But obviously, a ship in the harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. We can live our lives without taking risks, but that's what life is all about. So we want to live a life that we hope to live the way we want it to be. And that cannot be left to chance. You need to plan, choose, conceive and manage it very carefully. If you want to be the person you want to be, you must walk, talk and behave like the person you want to be. I had walked into the room of Dato Ahmad Kardas, who was at that time the managing director of one of Malaysia's largest infrastructure companies. And he said, Palan, a person's self, personally, and the public self of that person must be congruent, must be aligned. If it's not, you're not authentic and people can see through that. So the key is we need to get that alignment and we need to design our lives to move forward. But we live in a hierarchical society. What's a hierarchical society? How high up am I in the org chart? How wealthy am I? How much of power or influence I have? We grapple with these questions. But the question is, living life by designing is applying the checks and balances and reviewing, reflecting and moving forward in order to progress onto the lives that we hope to achieve. Moving forward here. <laughs> Three questions from the article. Question number one, how do we find happiness in our careers? Question number two, how do we ensure our relationship with family proves to be an enduring source of happiness? And question number three, how do I live a life of integrity? How can we apply business theories to answer these questions? Towards the end of the semester, Professor Clayton Christensen says to some of these students, who are the brightest kids in the world who go to pursue on an MBA in the Ivy League and says, turn on these questions onto yourself. If you don't figure it out now, it's very unlikely you're going to figure it out 20, 30 years later when you are so, so busy. So let's look at question number one. How do we find happiness in our careers? Moving on. How do we find happiness in our careers? How does your mind work in relation to motivation? Whenever people talk about motivation, there are so many variables. X plus Y is equals X, Y. What happens if I don't get more money? What happens if I get more money? What happens if I get this job? What motivates me? So many, many variables in that equation. I remember teaching a group of young engineers from Texas Instruments for the Malaysia chapter of Institute of Supervisory Management about 40 years ago. And I was trying to explain to them what the Hertzberg theory of motivation was, which is likely to provide answers to question one. Hertzberg put forward the theory that there are hygiene factors and dissatisfiers as opposed to satisfiers and motivators. And he said, if someone was unhappy with money, working conditions or facilities, they're going to be unhappy and dissatisfied. But an abundance of money does not create satisfaction or motivation. All he said was a lack of money creates unhappiness and dissatisfaction, but an abundance of it does not create satisfaction or motivation. But for someone to be motivated, you need an opportunity to grow, opportunity to learn, opportunity to be empowered and be recognized. And he said that was the importance of motivation. And it's when people are motivated, they are happy who they are and what they are, and they have a high level of self-esteem. But self-esteem is a very fragile concept. Fragile self-esteem is something very fragile, and it's like a butterfly. Charlie Flowers, a burly Texan speaker 
once talked about butterflies and self-esteem. And he said, if you wanted to care for a few butterflies, you better care for a few caterpillars. People, when they come to you, they're not competent. You need to guide them, coach them, make them competent. Care for a few caterpillars before you care for a few butter butterflies. And he also said, the butterfly is very fragile and soft. You place it on the palm and, and blow, it floats into the air. Right opposite, you smash it, you crush it, and it's gone and you have had a crease on your palms and stain on your palms. And he said, the human ego, self-esteem is exactly similar. And he said, if you appreciate someone, if you recognize someone, you give them an opportunity to learn and grow, their self-esteem grows. But if you give them unjustified criticism, if you don't listen to them when they're talking, if you raise your voice when you can't make your point and get your ideas across, you are not present in the room, but you are present in the room, of course, they feel unimportant and their self-esteem is very likely to be crushed. Making money, of course, it's important. Husband has told enough about it and a lack of it creates dissatisfaction and abundance does not create motivation. And I think it's very important for us to understand that, that what satisfies, what motivates people is those intrinsic factors, not extrinsic factors. Sometimes people come and ask me and my academic colleagues and they just say, look, aren't you bored teaching the same subject year after year? Are you not bored running the same business year after year? And my answer is very simple. Every time we go to the graduation, convocation, function, my academic colleagues and myself, we are stunned. We are thrilled. That's the time when we find that our purpose in lives have been met. We find tremendous satisfaction in our careers. Why do I say that? I'll tell you. When doctors, medical doctors graduate and they go on to become um, specialists or some of them from very financially challenged backgrounds. There's no way they could complete a program because you do not have the financial resources to complete a medical program. The university finds ways and means, even though we are a private university, to find financial assistance to help them complete the program. They finish the course, they go on to become very successful. They come back to the university and tell us, look, we never knew that this was possible. We could spread self-esteem to many people. Self-esteem is a chain effect. A happy person, a person with high self-esteem keeps pushing it around. And they say, look, what we can do is something fabulous, something fascinating. And more importantly, we can have three meals in our house. I have a car today. I have a home today, even though I got a mortgage to pay. And these are kids from financially challenged backgrounds who have now moved up what Dr. Raj Chetty from Harvard calls intergenerational mobility. Their lives are five times, six times better than what their parents was. So how do we find happiness in our careers? Through those intrinsic factors rather than the extr extrinsic factors. I have on the webinar, Ms. Nadia Tan, the Director of Human Resources and Human Capital from one of Malaysia's most successful companies, SP Satya. I've asked her to just answer this question. We try to apply the Herzberg theory to answer a question. And each one of us have got to figure out our, ourselves what the answer is. But I've asked Nadia to kindly share with us for just a minute. How does she find happiness in her career? Or how does she make sure that people are happy in their careers? Nadia, could we have your comments, please? Hi, morning, Tansri. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, it's um, it's interesting you uh, you you shared the Herzberg theory because uh, when I was thinking about it, it's it's basically for me um, I look at it from a, like a triangle. So um, what makes me happy, and and we're all human beings. So I I would say every single employee is 
feeling the same if not and maybe the motivations would be different um for me personally number one is uh, you know the 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 it's surrounding your own personal uh, passion if if i'm able to do what i enjoy um and am i supported by the environment uh, where my values are aligned am i respected am i uh, feeling appreciated uh, uh, do i feel safe you know and and lastly is this whole uh, achievement uh, space of goals you know where uh, do i feel that i can actually uh, actually achieve what i want to do so i believe you know everyone has this three elements um having being able to drive the passion that you have uh feeling that you can drive this passion within an environment that is aligned to your values and being able to see that you you can achieve what you want to achieve so often times i ask myself i can have a very busy day uh but what makes me happy at the end of the day it's is the three elements that actually makes me happy and it's so true tanshri you talk about money i mean i've been in hr for 27 years many many different environments and so on i think money is something that is short term uh but along the way it it what makes people feel that is most important so i think uh from a hr perspective from a talent perspective we really need to connect with each individual and really understand what makes them tick i think it's very basic uh, concept but sometimes we forget as we go along um and 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 and, and uh, everyone else would have the same thing that they want uh, there's this myth about you know the a generational thing a baby boomers gen x gen y i i do think that everyone wants the same thing uh, we just live through different era and we may have been stimulated uh, differently but we all want the same thing i hope that helps thank you so much nadia thank you so much for sharing i do uh, uh, agree with uh, all of what you say i think it's very important for us to find that happiness and ensure that each one of us promote self esteem and we have a high level of self esteem moving on i think question number 2 how do i ensure my relationship with family proves to be an enduring source of happiness and what professor clayton christensen says is look just turn the theory of defining strategy and resource allocation to your personal lives and try and answer this question and he keeps saying that some of the keys some of the key messages and he keeps saying this that some of the students who go to ivy league not some all students who go to ivy league universities trying to pursue an mba are some of the smartest kids on earth they are the 99th percentile they design and implement strategies for some of the most successful organizations in the world but they forget to just define and pursue a life strategy and the message is strategy is not what's given to you by the company or on the walls or on the website what is strategy is what employees do every single day what choices we make every single day how do we spend our time talents and energy unfortunately in the business world we have a short term horizon we need to maximize profitability we need to have return on investment immediate tangible gains so companies strategy is determined by the types of initiatives that management invests in but because of the short term horizon we find that companies short change investments in initiatives that are crucial to long term strategies dan goldman in his book uses a concept from stanford professor walter mischel he says instant gratification you give a kid a box of marshmallows and tell the kid you can have it now or you can have two boxes of marshmallows in 2 hours what does the kid choose the one that chooses the one box instantly is likely to be far more impulsive than the one research shows who delays gratification so the question is how can we balance short term horizons with long term horizons and that i think is the key now each one of us have got 24 hours in a day time is the only commodity that i cannot create more 
seven days a week, 168 hours a week, no more, no less. And how I spend this time is very critical. And we find after 20 years, we have a health challenge and we wish that we had done 20 minutes exercise every single day. Life is best understood backwards, but has to be lived forwards. We miss the importance of prayer. Some people say, look, I don't believe in prayer. But what is prayer? Prayer is nothing but taking time out, reflecting, connecting with yourself, pause and prepare to get back on track. That's what it is. So there are many concepts that we could apply to answer the question, how do I find relationships to be positive? So I think the key question is purpose in life. How do I find that purpose in life, the strategy? And number two, how do I allocate the resources in the proper way? Stephen Covey, author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People said this, sharpen your axe to remain productive. Take time out to learn. If you say I have no time to sharpen my axe, it's very unlikely you are going to be productive. Malcolm Gladwell talked about the 10,000 hour rule where he said anyone and everyone can invest. If you want to invest 10,000 rules, then of course you can become an expert. But when you talk about short term and you talk about long term horizons, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Edgar Schein, talks about the tools of cooperation. He says when you want to introduce change in an organization, you need cooperation or you need to use power tools. And what are power tools? Power tools are punishment, threats, coercion. But we all know, just like in business, in families, the power tools do not work beyond a point. When our kids become teenagers and adults, you know that power tools no longer works. What works is the culture that we are built in. Just like organizations have cultures, families and cultures too. And we want to invest the time to build those cultures over a sustained period of time. In business, you could say, this quarter, I did well, our profits were up. You can't say that in families. This quarter, our family was good. You will have to wait for a period of 20 years to say that we raised good kids. We had a good family life. You want to make sure that kids instinctively, respectfully behave towards one another. All the time they choose the right things to do. They have a high degree of self-esteem and self-confidence. Mm. This doesn't happen overnight. Children, like employees, they build self-esteem by doing things that are hard and learning what works. I think it's critical. But the, the, the fact is, we all make mistakes. Now, I am as responsible as anyone else. I've probably been looking at my WhatsApp messages when I'm talking to someone. I raise my voice when I've not been able to convince someone. I've done, a, we all make mistakes. But remember the concept of self, self-awareness and self-image. We try to look at it, we reflect, and we try and apply some of the learning to answer the question, how do I ensure my relationship with families proves to be an enduring source of happiness. We have on the webinar, Professor Haji Dr. Zhu, an industry practitioner as well as an academic. And I have asked him, and he has been one of the most, most busy people that I've ever known. When he was with Malaysian Airlines, he was on a plane everywhere, every other week, but he raised a good family. And I just wanted to just draw upon from him just for a minute. How does he manage work in conjunction with his life strategy? Haji Zo, could we have your comments, please, Haji? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dantri. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts here. To me, values is the first step in building to whatever culture. You know. Because from uh, my, my own experience uh, as a parent, 
I strongly believe the first step to building a strong, lasting family culture is values, the right values. You know. So I practice um, family values uh, based on you know what have been taught to me, you know, by my parent, my grandparent. You know. So I, I just expand and extend it to uh, to my family. <clears throat> Now, a culture is composed of um, shared values, shared behaviors, and shared beliefs. Now, because if if we have embedded in the these values, which individually it is a kind of uh, guidance for us to move about as an individual as a parent as a manager in uh, our organization yeah. and also in the community yeah. so without strong groundings on values you can go astray let's take uh, our children you know if we have built the right values in them you know we can be rest assured they know how to take care of themselves when they are with their friends with their classmates or with your colleagues. I practice Tantri get the very simple values. Because I impress upon them and I show example on humility. How you want to how you you know you need to show your humbleness. Because that is the the fundamental uh, practices when we were in kampung you you must always respect your elders uh, you must love the, the the young people you know so anybody that you meet they are a source of learning to you so you must keep on get to to be humble you know? uh-huh. and then get the day we we, we need uh, to show this uh, humbleness get the, through through the behaviors you know? So in order for us to to, to really practice kita, what we believe. Thank you. Number two, country kita is for self uh, self respect and mutual respect. So we respect, uh, we want people to respect us. Therefore, uh, we should demonstrate it. Thank you. By respecting others, you know. So number three is <laughs> very simple. You know, we say that the uh, coexistent, balance coexistent. That mean uh, everybody the need to, to have uh, you know their own life. You know, so we respect uh, what what others uh, believe. You know, without having to impose that my values is right, your values is wrong. No, because uh, you 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 have the right values like um, being humble. Mutual respect, and then you believe in the coexistence within your community. You know, it can be used anywhere. So this is what kita, I have been practicing, and Thank I you. hope that my children will continue with to do that. Thank you, Nutri. Thank you so much, Haji, because I do know that every single moment when you have been in Malaysian Airlines, you have been in many other organizations. I know that. You are one of those few people where your personal self is very congruent with your public self. You are such an authentic person. Thank you. And I thank think you. the second one that Professor Clayton Christian talks so much about it. Thank you for bringing that up. It's about humility. Now, moving on to question three. Thank you, Ajit. Moving on to question three. How do I live a life of integrity? And I think... It came out from what Ajit just now said, Dr. Ajit said. It's the value systems. Integrity is doing the right thing when no one is watching. And I think it's about the humility, a study on the characteristics of 
ethically and successful people, ethical successful people. One of the things that came out was it's a sense of humility. They have great self-esteem. They have got great self-confidence. They feel good about themselves and good behavior flows from humility. But one of the theories that we're all in business familiar is marginal cost and marginal revenues. When we evaluate alternative investments, we are told ignore sunken costs, ignore fixed costs and instead base decisions on marginal costs and marginal revenues that each alternative entails. Now, we learn from this doctrine that companies leverage what they put in place in the past so that this can happen in the future. They don't create the capabilities for the future. They're just hoping what happened in the past will happen in the future. But we know that 2020 was not 2019. The future is always going to be different. In that sense, it will just not be possible. So the theory of marginal cost costing, the theory of marginal costing, helps us answer question three. Whenever we have to choose between right and good in our personal lives, unconsciously we apply the just this one time doctrine, just this one time mindset. We know it's not correct, but in this particular difficult circumstances, just this one time, let me do it because I need to do it. I need to survive. And we do it and then it becomes so attractive you repeat it you repeat it just one time becomes every time and we have lost the plot we have lost the plot justification for dishonesty justification for cheating stealing lying infidelity all comes from applying the marginal cost doctrine just this one time and that's the message that comes from Professor Clayton Christensen. He says, make a decision what you stand for, the values, and then stand for it 100% of the time, not 98%. 98% leads you on a completely different path. And coming from values, it takes us to the importance of humility and why humility is so important. It's about respect, it's about honesty, it's about learning. And moving on to part three, which is the final part, which is, okay, what's the metric you are going to choose in order for your life to be measured? Choice of measurement is a big deal. In business, we aggregate measures of success. In accounting, we aggregate things the numerator, the denominator. We know revenue, we know cost, we know profits. We look at short-term measures of success. But life is not accounting. Life is not accounting. The metric by which your life will be judged is not by your prominence, is not by how wealthy you are, how much influential or powerful you are, but by how much we have impacted people communities, societies, countries in different ways. And it will be insane to say that I as an individual can't impact people. Each one of us can. And that's what we need to do. We need to think about a metric. Our life will be measured. We need to make a commitment to that, to live every day 100% so that in the end of our lives, our life can be measured by that metric. 100% live it, not 98%. Look at some of the people, Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela. Mahatma Gandhi chose a metric, non-violence. Whatever the British did to him, he said, you can crush my bones, you can beat me up, you can kill me, but I'm not going to resort with violence. And that was a metric he chose. Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement, he chose a metric to generate equality for every single American, irrespective of the color of the skin, using a non-violent way. Nelson Mandela came up and said, many people said I lost one year of my life, but just remember to put it in context. Nelson Mandela lost 26 years of his life. And he said, look, I may not be able to forget, but I'm going to choose forgiveness 
as my way forward. I'm going to be forgiving as a way forward. When we look, when we try to justify infidelity or when we try to justify dishonesty or cheating, we always, we said, use the just one time mindset. But if you had a metric by which you are going to stay firm 100% of the time, then that's how your life is going to be measured. So moving forward, one of the key things for us to understand is what life is. Life is 10% what happens to you, go back to this. Life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you respond to it. We all know that sometimes we go off course, but it's never too late to reset and come back on track. It's life. So that's what life is. And that's what Luke Holmes said about life. And of course, there was also this very famous expression, the world does not go into trouble when evil people do something. The world is in trouble when good people do not have the courage to stand up when it's time to stand up and to sit down when it's time to sit down. Now, what I want to demonstrate here is a video clip from the movie A Few Good Men, a sparring session between Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise. How we handle the truth? How do we have the courage, the conviction to stand up? I think we need to just watch that clip just for a minute and then I'll come back to the webinar. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Son, we live in a world that has walls and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's going to do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know, that Santiago's death while tragic probably saved lives. And my existence while grotesque and incomprehensible to you saves lives. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom that I provide and then questions the manner in which I provide it. I would rather you just said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a weapon and stand a post. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. Did you order the code red? I did the job. Did you order the code red? You're goddamn right I did. Thank you. You know what the code red is. The code red is basically taking out the life of a person. And I think, do you actually move the goalpost? Can we do something 98% rather than 100%? And the message that we try to take out if you want to live the life of integrity and choose the right yardstick is decide what you stand for and stand for it all the time. We looked at the importance of reflection. We looked at those three questions. And of course, we use different theories to answer those three questions using the concepts of intrinsic factors, resource allocations, and just one-time marginal costing. Of course, our behaviors and decisions we make based on the value systems, what do we stand for, resulting in finally us choosing a metric. Now, obviously, if you read the article again and again, it's very clear, not prescriptive. It just provides you a set of tools and you choose and you figure out what is the metric by which you need your life to be judged. It says, well, have a life strategy, pursue it, whatever it is, you figure it out, you choose a yardstick, and then you measure, are you on track? Are you on track to live the life that you hope to live? That's primarily what it is, ladies and gentlemen. And moving on to the conclusion of the webinar, 
please move on. Thank you so much for your participation this morning. That's my email, drpalan at sabijaya.edu.my. My personal website, palan.org, where the blog post is available. The slides will be available as Karen uh, articulated right at the beginning of the webinar at smrhrgroup.com. That's my 16th book recently published by University of Malaya Publishing, uh, Reflections of an Entrepreneur. And all royalty proceed goes towards education scholarships. If you wish to make a contribution, the book is available at Shopee and the link is available out there on the slide. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I believe that we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. We look at what some of the questions are and I may not be able to answer all the questions because we will need to conclude the webinar on time. However, whatever questions that remain unanswered, we'll try to answer and put them up on the website. Again, terima kasih and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tansri, for the very interesting session. I believe we have some questions here that you uh, may wish to answer. Uh, there are a number here, but I think the time is limited. So I'll read out the first question. It's from uh, Umpa, sorry, Uma Parent Govindan. He says, Tansri, I think the elements of self-esteem and life as a balanced measure need to be cultivated from young. It needs to be integrated into the education system indeed. As a clinical educator, how can I cultivate this in my undergraduate students? And second question, should we integrate these motivational theories into the existing, existing curriculum? Uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, obviously, I, I would agree. And I think if you listen to Haji's comments, and if you read the article from Professor Clayton Christensen, and in my own experience, enduring source of happiness in anything that we want to do has to be a long-term investment. And so you're right, building self-esteem is in 100% of everyday choices that we make. And therefore, every single thing that we do promotes the self-esteem of the children in school, the right choice of words, the vocabulary, how do we treat them when they have done something wrong? What do we do when someone is not as intelligent as another? And I think it's about making sure that we promote self-esteem at every single stage. As Charlie Flowers said, self-esteem is like a butterfly, very fragile, very soft. You promote it, it just flies away. You crush it, it's crushed for a long time and service recovery takes a long, long time. And I think the second, what you said, I think it's very important to practice that again on a daily basis. Thank you, Omar. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Hope I answered the question. Thank you, Karen. We can move on to that. Thank you, Tansri. Uh, we have another question here from Johan Erwan uh, Kamaruzaman. I have met so many people that ask, what is my passion? When talking about passion, in your opinion, do we find our passion or do we develop our passion? Well, I think the answer is you will have to figure it out for yourself. That's what experiential educators has never told them what it is. And I think you will figure it out because what makes you most happy? Now, I do know that I have enjoyed sharing ideas, whether it's writing, whether it's speaking. But over the years that I have found that I figured out what my passion is. And when I figure out what my passion is, that's where I allocate my resources most. I feel good. And you, 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 anybody with a high degree of passion, high degree of self-esteem are so happy as to who they are and what they do. And so the question is, it's not this or that, but I think it's on the journey. You will figure out what your passion is and you just have got to keep working on it. But remember, what Malcolm Gladwell said, the 10,000 hour rule. No one is going to invest 10,000 hours in learning something if they do not have the passion. So I hope I answered that question, Johan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tansri. There is another question here from Nuru Atika. Is there a need to measure your life? Why and why not? When do you start measuring your life? 
Thank you, Nuru. As I said, measurement is something of a yardstick. We need to do that all the time. It's not when we start or when we stop. I think we have a journey and I think life is something that you want to, you, you, it's not something that's infinite, it's finite. Everyone has to go away. We are all mortal. We leave this world at a certain point. So what have we done? You might be a teacher in the school and you are making a huge contribution to all the young people who have gone through the school. And therefore, you want to just measure what's the contribution you are making to those young children's lives. And I think the important question is, it is important to measure. We can't say that it's not important to measure because only people who do not measure their lives are people who are challenged mentally and they do not live in this world. Anyone who lives in this world would want to know whether they are progressing or they're not progressing because that's the spirit of the human being. We want to grow and every one of us want to grow, but in a certain way with certain value systems in a certain track. And that's the purpose why we need to have a yardstick to measure our lives. Not to judge our lives, but to measure. I think that's important. Thank you, Karen. I think we can take another two questions, I think. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tansri. The next question is from Piriya Arumugam. Uh, she says, fantastic session, Tansri. Clayton Christensen in his book mentioned, don't fall into a trap of marginal thinking. Could Tansri elaborate for me to understand? I talked about it just one time. Remember, when you have to make a, a choice in our personal lives between good and wrong, and I think you apply just this one time. So why just one time? Oh, I know this is the wrong thing to do. Uh, I shouldn't be cheating on my attendance. Uh, it's very wrong. Uh, it's not what my parents taught me. It's not what my religion taught me. That's not the right thing to do. But just today, it's okay. Everybody else does it. Let me do it just this one time. Let me just cheat on my attendance and you go in. And when you fall into the trap of just one time, you tend to repeat it again and again and again. And that's what becomes every time. And when it becomes every time, you've lost the plot. So if you have a value system, then you live by that value system 100% all the time, not 98%. That's the marginal cost thinking or the just one time mindset, which harms so many people and why people cannot live a life of integrity. Now, look, we all make mistakes. We have all have challenges. And I think the important thing is we're never going to live 100% like saints. We make mistakes, but the key message is it's never too late to reset. Remember, reflect, time out, pause, prepare, get back on track, on course. Just in time mindset is one of the most dangerous things when it comes across in life. When our children, I said this, it's a long-term family investments, relationships. When we say, look, we want our children to behave respectful to one another. Dr. Haji Zul talked about it. We want coexistence, not judging one another. We want people uh, to kind of choose the right thing to do. We are not watching. We want them to behave morally correct, spiritually correct. Safety-wise, we want them to do whatever that's correct. That's when we have invested in the value systems to build that culture. Just like organizations have cultures, families have cultures. But the just in one time is a deviation, is a digression, is a distraction, which takes us away from the path that we want to go. And when we do it one time, we end up doing all the time and we lose the problem. Hope I answered the question, Karen. Thank you, uh, Tansuri. I think this will be our final question due to time constraint. I'm not sure whether this is a comment or a question, but Tansuri, would you like to comment on it? Yeah. It's from Dato Ong Ingbin. He says, Tansuri, 
I always wonder how important is religion or spiritually is to helping one balance life and reflect on it. I think I mentioned it much earlier. I think one of my academic colleagues who is very religious, he is a uh, he prays five times a day. He lives life by that maxim, and he said, "Man proposes, God disposes." And I think he's a very authentic person. Personal self and public self is very aligned. Then, of course, I have a rationalist colleague who does not believe in religion. And he said, I believe in the Malthusian checks, natural checks that come up. So to those of you who believe in religion, fine, good. I don't want to be prescriptive, just as Professor Clayton Christensen was not prescriptive. Religion provides us certain guidelines. It allows us certain rituals so that we could connect with ourselves and we live certain value systems. Of course, to those people who believe in nature, not necessarily religion, can also be spiritual because spirituality is beyond religion. There are certain value systems, and I think we invest in these value systems in order to go on. So I, I don't want to answer the question whether this is important or that's important. But I, what I want to say is that personally, to me, I am religious. I do do certain things that's important for me. But to me, the prayer is a very important moment. When I connect with myself, I reflect, I pause, I prepare. Some people, they're not religious, but they meditate, they connect with themselves. Some people, they follow the rituals. It's very important for them because that's the path that they have chosen. So to answer the question, to Gato Ong's question, I think spirituality includes religion. And that's what I think is important. But at the end of the day, you figure out what's important for you and you choose the value systems and you choose the metrics by which you wish your life to be measured. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Karen, for uh, sharing the session and taking time out on a Saturday. And Karen Ong is an amazing learning facilitator who has spent 25 years and her commitment is to make sure that every single learner who goes on her program goes away learning something rather than just being a passenger. That's the metric that she chose to live by for the last 25 years. So thank you so much. It's been an honor to have you here today, Karen. Thank you, Tan Sri, for your kind words. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for your questions and also for to everyone who has attended the session today on this Saturday morning. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and look forward to seeing you at our next uh, session. Uh, I believe it's called a self-reflection uh, series. So see you next time. Thank you once again. Terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you. Terima kasih.